Hello, I'm Laura Furiosi, divorced mother of three, and I'm here with my mother, Lynette Galvin, with 35 years' experience in family law. You're listening to the Divorce Course Podcast. Through our candid discussions, we hope to help you through your divorce or de facto separation. We will be answering the most commonly asked questions and covering the stages and steps that you will face on your way to freedom. Have you just received documents with proposed orders that at the bottom say that you need to pay your ex's costs? Well, this episode is for you because we're going to be talking today about what costs are, what it means, the types and the offers that you can make or receive, and when they can occur, who can make them and make the decision and why. Welcome, (laughs) Mum. That's a lot, Laura. Let's hope we can do all of that. All you wanted to know about costs, but we're afraid to ask. (laughs) Well, look, costs in legal yes. family law world, are, it, it seems very expensive, like you've said before many mm. times. It's like $50 to read a letter. It's then, you know, $300 to write something. And like you said in the last episode, $3,000 to fill in all those mm. forms. Mm. So costs are a big deal to anybody. Yep. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're poor or rich, you know, you, there is a lot of money involved in if you get someone to represent you mm. or even if you're self-represented and you're filing things and it costs you say a hundred dollars yep. to a thousand dollars to file it. So what's the deal with costs in the family court? Okay. So the court uses costs as a sort of a way of managing people's behaviour and making sure that they behave themselves in the court. So you pretty well always have to pay your own costs. In children's matters, you have to pay your own costs. That pretty well goes without So legal fees. Legal. Costs is legal costs fees, is legal right? legal fees, filing fees in the court, um, maybe what you paid for a barrister, what you paid for a someone to serve the documents on the other side, all of those things. So I thought you were going to say that costs mean many things and I was going to say you are absolutely right. It's it's a (laughs) movable feast, costs. So there's your costs, there's their costs, there's party and party costs, there's indemnity costs, there's costs thrown away. You'll see all of those expressions bandied around. But hopefully we can simplify them a little bit today. The easiest one, Laura, and the one I think though that worries people the most is when they get an application Mm to court from the other side and it might be parenting or it might be property orders and it lists all the things they want, sell the house, I'll have the kids these days, joint parental responsibility or equal shared parental responsibility, all of that. And at the bottom it says that the respondent pay the applicant's costs of and incidental to these proceedings. And sometimes it says that the the respondent pay the applicant's costs on an indemnity basis and that can be really frightening. Uh, But you need to know that that sort of Last order, usually, or just before the one that says such further or other odd order order as this honourable court deems meet or appropriate, right? It's the second last order. It's, if it's there, it's just really kind of a throwaway line. Um, so there's, it's there in case you do something that would render it possible for them to ask that you pay their costs, but it's not, um, that you've done anything wrong already. Okay. It's a place saver. Jen. Generally, generally, yes. excuse me, I'm still not feeling that great. <laughs> generally, if you have a, uh, like as a lawyer, mum, you've got templates, yeah, right? Precedents, I yep, think is the word sure. you. Is that, is it that is, order? It's on the bottom. Just at the yeah, bottom. It's on the bottom. Okay, of so people everything. just, it's just their order. It's order-like the last two pretty orders. Much. Costs and such other, or further other orders is on a royal court deems meet which really confuses. Okay. So before anyone Panic. starts yeah. looking daggers at their ex, if it's amicable or maybe ah. just slightly avoidant, or um, it's probably good to remember, it's probably not them no, asking maybe. No. It's just the lawyers put it in as a default. But that could cause a fire. Uh, yeah, I've in, never in, ever in heard the... of a client asking me to ask them to pay costs at that early stage. So it is. you can be mm. pretty well guaranteed it's a bit of a throwaway line, by the lawyer. Good point, Laura. And so this is general advice only though, because every situation is different. Okay. So, so that clause or that line, whatever you call mm. it at the bottom that they're seeking, uh, as we talked about in the last episode, you, you get this initiating application served on you, you're freaking out, you've read the affidavit and then you read their order sort and down the bottom, it says it's going to, you have to pay their costs. And you're like, what? Yes. So that's standard. Yes. So it's a cover, like you said, to, it, it, and that's the way the court can somehow make people behave in court. Well, yes, that's 
it, it's inviting the court to make a cost order and it's putting the person on notice there could be a cost order, but uh, mm-hmm. it would really be if you've done something to, to deserve having to pay the other side's costs. Could you give me some examples mm. of okay. things? All right. Um, how about uh, not turning up to court uh, twice in a row? and they've turned up with the barrister and the solicitor, and then you still want to be heard on the third occasion, the court might say that's costs thrown away. Uh, or um, you might refuse to go and get a drug test or an alcohol test, and the courts are ordered you to. And if they have to bring an mm. application to force you to, which they can't really, um, then, you know, that might be something that warrants costs. If you are asking for something that is so far unreasonable that it couldn't possibly be an outcome at law that's even possible Mm. Um, and you persist in chasing that unreasonable outcome you could be ordered to pay costs um Okay, so if you've got an if you've got an order that's asking that a unicorn be delivered to you by the seventh of August, um, or else, like this is obviously whatever random Hmm. thing that you can think of that's not possible, and you insist on it, insist on it, and don't settle, and it keeps going. What they can order costs against you because you're being unreasonable. So it would it doesn't have to be that that weird. Like it could be Hmm. um, that they deliver the the dog. Um, to me, you know, and and the court's going to say we don't do dog orders, <laughs> so mm-hmm. just do that all the way to the end, and that's the only issue the court might hit you up for costs because that's a pretty stupid application. You should have settled it. Yeah. Okay, so silly things yes. and bad behaviour. Yes. So sometimes silly things could be because that person hasn't seen a lawyer, sometimes. so that could bite or you in the bottom just, because you don't know lawyer. That's right. You need to go and check with the silly things um, and. What you think might be very reasonable may become uh, a stretch and a, maybe an un, unachievable outcome as time goes hmm. by. For instance, if there's a family report or if there's a psych report that s- doesn't support your case, so or if there's overwhelming evidence from the other side, affidavits and proof everywhere that what you thought was happening isn't happening and what you want isn't justified under the evidence the court that the court may look at uh, punishing you with costs. Generally, in children's matters, the court doesn't uh, because okay. what, what's right for the kids is really a subjective thing, really, from both parties. With property, though, um, they might order costs. And for property, it might be if you don't make if you don't give your documents over when you're supposed to. Okay, well, that's a question I wanted to ask you because, yeah, so you're saying cost is used as a behaviour, <laughs> make sure people behave, they're not wasting the court time because it does co- cost the federal budget money to pay right. for judges to sit at a bench. But, hang on. Not handing. But they don't give, they don't order costs to be paid to the court. It's usually to the I know. party. Oh, sorry. I know. Yeah, that's true. So, but so if you don't hand in your documents on time, so kind of like, you know, they feel like assignments, you look at how big some of those things are that you have to fill in all that, that we just talked about in the last episode. If you don't hand your documents in by the due date, is that, uh, you could pay costs because you're wasting time? Right, because if the court then was working on the assumption those documents would be filed and they haven't been and the matter can't progress, but, you know, your ex has turned up and they've done all the right things, or even if you've turned up mm. done all the right things and they haven't, um, you could ask that the court order that he pay your costs of that day that are thrown away because he hasn't filed any orders or documents as required. All right, so costs is used as like a behavioural management system because I guess they can't give you a paddywhack on the bottom no. with, a, with a stick yeah. like they used to in primary school. So... Um, when though, mum, are costs, when a cost, like, so that, yes, you've got it as a generic thing in your templates for things that you send to people of order sort, but when are costs payable and implication, when do they happen? Like, yeah. so you're in court, maybe you've stuffed up, maybe you've asked for something unreasonable, maybe your ex hasn't turned up a couple of times. When do the costs happen? Okay. When do you, when does a judge say you're going to have to pay costs? It depends. So sometimes it's on that interim application. You show up, um, your lawyer stands up and says, well, I don't know where Mr. Such and Such is. He has and turned up and um, we're ready to go um, but you know 
but for some reason you don't look for default orders on the day. You might say, look, this is wasted day and there's no excuse. Uh, could your honour order that he, the, the missing person, pay my client's costs for today? And the judge might make that order then and there. Or the judge might mm-hmm. say, as some of them do, oh, you have a good point there, um, Mrs Galvin, but, um, well, how about we say costs are reserved and we'll sort that out at the final hearing. And that's kind of a not a right. yes, not a no. It just gets sort of shunted to the end, um, and and so that but right. can make a, an order about costs. Usually has to be within twenty eight days of any. Um, you have to have the application for costs within twenty eight days of any any order being made. So the judge might make an order on that day that the matter be adjourned because you know Mr. Such or Mrs. Such and Such didn't turn up. And then you've got 28 days from then to ask the court to give you costs of that day thrown away. But generally people ask for it when they're there, you know. You're on it, you know, my clients put to expense for no reason. Um, and you don't get all of that. If you're self-represented, can you ask for costs if they're wasting time? Uh, not really. Because I guess you, you're not really paying any. What about fees for filing? Can you ask for costs to be paid? Sometimes sometimes on a contravention maybe if they've caused that application, mm-hmm. but no, not normally because you, you okay. have to file a cost, have to file, pay to file anyway. Now, there was one other question that we get asked literally like 10 times a day, and that is about disclosure. Yes. People are saying all the time that my ex isn't giving me disclosure. They're not giving me my bank, the bank statements. They're not giving me the documents that, and I know they've got this and they're not giving it to me. What's going to happen? We're going to go to, we're going to go to court tomorrow and I still don't have it. Is cost an implication for not disclosing in property? If you're in court tomorrow and you don't have those documents, you're, you, you're, you'd be saying to the judge, well, I'm sorry, Your Honour, we're not in a position to move the matter forward. We don't know um, what offer we can make because he, she hasn't given us the bank statement. So could you adjourn the case and can you order costs against that person for their delay? The judge might say to them if they're there, well, why haven't you? Oh, you know, my accountant, um, I can only get certain, got, nah, you know, and the judge might costs or reserve costs or he may say that if on the next occasion they don't have the documents then costs will be awarded against them to all our listeners who constantly write in asking about this disclosure issue can they write to the to their ex or to the lawyers and say or get the lawyers to say you haven't disclosed we're going to ask for costs if it's not there by the court date? Um, yes, sort of. Um, I prefer to write and say you haven't disclosed. We're issuing a subpoena tomorrow and we'll be seeking the costs of that subpoena against your client because he's had or she's had ample opportunity to respond. And then you just... Okay. Because I don't... Like, I know they use the word disclosure, but the old word used to be discovery and I think that's much more proactive. <laughs> You're not waiting for them to open up the tin and let you have a look. You're going there and ripping yeah. the lid off and having a look. And and that means, and your lawyers, and we've given a whole lesson in our um, web, in our course, haven't we, on how to find out. And our podcast episode is also one of our most popular DIY disclosure. And one of our TikToks, which is just me pointing at the screen of the ways to do it, um, is very popular as well. So definitely... Ch- People have, yes. So... Yeah, that's a question people have. So, yeah, so we're not we're not going to lie around waiting and feeling helpless and hand wringing. Um, we all of us can just go and find out the information for ourselves. <laughs> what is a Calderbank Calder offer? Bank. So, Calderbank was an old case. I think it's an old English case, and that is just one they use uh, sometimes in the family court, but it's not necessary because we've got a section of the act where you put an offer to the other side. So like, let's say it's, let's say it's the 8th of January. Okay. And you write a letter to the other side, you mark it without prejudice, except for costs. And you say, this is a call to bank offer. I'm prepared to settle this case today for a hundred thousand dollars. And um, this offer is open until uh, August or whatever. Then you keep that letter, right? If they don't answer or if they don't accept that offer uh, and you go to court and they get, um, you get the same as what you've offered or even a better outcome than what you offered. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, 
uh, no, beg your pardon, if you get the same as what you offered or a better outcome if you, uh, than you wanted, um, then you show the court this letter and say, look, it words the effect of your honour, we're only here. I, I made this offer way back in January and it was a reasonable offer as is proved because that's what I've got in my outcome um, or better than that, that's what the judge has ordered. And we're only here because someone was unreasonable and that's the other party. And you can show that to the court and under Section 117C the court may order that from the date that you made that offer, so all of your legal fees, well not all of it, but legal fees from the January date to the August date, um, you tally them up and the court um, might order that, that the other person pay those ones from the date you filed that offer because that was unreasonable. So on an indemnity basis, it's pretty well all of your costs. If it's on a party and party basis, then it doesn't cover things like consultations with your lawyer and your barrister, but it does cover costs of filing documents. So it's a big risk once you file that. If you get a letter with Calderbank written on it or Section 117C of the Family Law Act written on it, Take it very seriously because if that offer is around about what your lawyer or what you think is about right, um, you'd want to think very carefully before you reject it because it could you could end up costing you not only your legal fees to keep dragging it on, but the other person's legal fees might get sheeted to right. you. And that and is that only in property or does that relate to children as well? That, parenting? I've extended it to children's matters. Um little bit weird though but um, I'm glad they did because you know you might be haggling over a day or two days and you've put a proposal the court says yeah that proposal is pretty well spot on they make an order the same then you can ask for costs the thing with um, Mm. the court's rules say that generally in family court proceedings each party bears their own costs so that's your default position right and there has to be something extra to make a court order one person to pay the costs. With property, um, property outcomes are usually easy to work out with a dollar figure to about 10%. If you've got two competent lawyers, for instance, advising each of you, one each, um, their answer should be about the same and therefore you just settle in that range. You might settle a little bit low but still in the range or a little bit high but still in the range and considering the legal fees you're saving, um, by settling it early. And that stress and the uncertainty of not knowing the outcome every day, um, it's worth, you know, settling on that range. Um, but with children's matters, the the num- there's not really a number that you can say, oh, this is what the judges usually do, you know. This is what the court would normally do for these children. There are some little hints in the legislation and the cases where some applications just plainly stupid um, and wrong and that um, someone's not listening to their lawyer at all. But the rest of it, it's a bit hard. It's it's more grey than black and white. And so, um, but, you, but the court has amended the rules years ago so that you can make an offer about children's matters and I would urge everyone to make their offers and get them in, make them clear and keep a copy. You don't file it. You send it to the other side. You tell them it's without prejudice except for costs, um, or you might even say uh, that it's a Calder Bank offer. <laughs> um, it's just an old case. But, yes, and and have that, put that in good and early because the earlier you put it in, the more like more of your fees they might have to pay. Can that backfire on you in any way? No. Okay. Because it's without prejudice, save us to cost. Right. And because the overarching purpose of the central practice direction of the court since September 2021 is to attempt to negotiate, try to settle it, try to settle it in a financially sensible way and don't drag things out, you know. So, okay. All right. So if you get given an offer, think very hard and think very I'd get some advice. Clearly. Yeah. Before get you- some advice and make sure that you aren't walking into a situation where you're going to end up paying their fees as well as your fees and getting a situation that you didn't want, well, right. you know. So answer you didn't want, the outcome you didn't want, mm-hmm. plus your legal fees, plus their legal fees. So it's a bit of a triple jeopardy. So you need to be sure mm-hmm. of your ground. 
if you're going to. And that's why you should definitely get some legal advice. So then the next one, Mum, the examples that we use in the divorce course, the DIY divorce blueprint is high conflict, manipulative, amicable and avoidant. So how does a cost order or a cost offer or a quarterback offer work with an avoidant person? Um, it doesn't really matter about – actually, it's a good thing. If you put that in against an avoidant person, um, it still benefits you whether they answer or not. You know, if they don't answer, mm. um, then that's a problem for them to deal with, I guess. Um, but would it maybe give them a little bit of a, a rocket under their seat to go, ooh, I don't want to have to pay her cost or his cost? I have – set out the provisions of Section 117C. When I've got someone on the other side who's not got a lawyer, um, mm-hmm. I would print that out or put cut and paste it into the letter so they can see what the risk is um, mm-hmm. um, and send that to them, making it absolutely certain. Um, mm-hmm. I think, uh, yeah, it does. It gives them a little dolly along and it, it protects your case, your circumstances. You do need to make offers when you've got an avoidant person because it's less likely to proceed. You know, they're, they're more likely to just sit on their hands and <laughs> you've got to do something. What about high conflict? What about high conflict? Um, well, even if they're high conflict, what are they going to do? You know, you're sending them the offer, you've told them what you're proposing, and they also have that jeopardy of potentially mm. if they're just doing it to get up your nose, um, they might have a think about whether it's actually worth doing it <laughs> um, when they're like okay. up for your costs and the costs of. Now, manip- manipulative and controlling, it's good that you put uh, pre- um, without, pre- without prejudice because that means don't show the judge because you might feel, oh, I'm writing an offer that isn't ideal but it's probably what I'm going to get but then if you get to court you might end up getting what you ideally yeah, want. You want but when you send it oh but on this date they wrote she wrote an offer no it, it's it's without prejudice say this cost they can't put it to you in the witness box they can't tell the judge about it um anything to do with negotiations is not to be discussed or raised in the trial Okay, so it all comes up after. So once you get it and you go, I often... Yeah. So I look at it this way. I, I, I often think of it like two conveyor belts. The one on the top is the one getting you through court and the one on the bottom is, and it's like like solid blocks, file this document, go to court, do this, do that, have this meeting, then it's court. Um, the one underneath is where you're all running around madly trying to settle it all the time. What about this? No, what about that? No, what about this? What if we have a mediation? But it doesn't slow down the upper conveyor belt, but but what happens on that lower conveyor belt, which is not ever disclosed, not going to jeopardise your case or anything, is where the real negotiation can happen because Everyone can do it freely without fear of it being raised in the court. And the court is very strong about not wanting to hear about negotiations. Like all you can say if you've been to mediation is that it did not settle. That's all you can say. Hmm. Or now you can also say if they tried to settle, if they made a genuine effort or attempt. It's not really you that says that, though. It'll be the mediator. True. Yeah. Yeah. True. Okay, so really when it comes down to costs, it's a way to manage behaviour and to maybe stop silliness. Mm. Uh, we, you know, we've talked about post-separation abuse. We've done a whole episode on that where sometimes people are just doing it for the sake of driving people crazy, um, less about the reasons for filing. And, and I think, I guess, costs could protect people from post-separation abuse, legal systems abuse. And a lot of people acting for themselves think, oh, well, it's not costing me anything. I'll keep filing these applications and I'll keep on because I like the fight and I'm not going to let them for mm. me. Um, but it all changes if there's a chance that this self-represented person might have to pay the other side's legal fees, you know. So mm. we sometimes use letters like, we're about to brief a barrister. It's going to get expensive. His rates are this. Um, we're going to do that at 9 a.m. Here's our final offer. Um, and if we don't hear from you by 9 a.m. in two, three days' time, then uh, we will go forward and uh, we will seek indemnity costs against you or costs against you. Just to make people think. If you're self-represented, don't do that, obviously. Go and see a lawyer, yes. you know, because like mum said, you can't sue for costs if you're self-represented. So that's important. And obviously this is all general advice. Yeah, you might get a letter like that and, and you've been thinking, oh, it doesn't cost me anything. Oh, okay, hang on. 
I might have to pay their legal fees. So then you need to find out if you're on the right track. And sometimes manipulative and controlling people can do those letters of offers with threats of costs. Um, but, but knowing, um, or what they should know, uh, sometimes that it's not a reasonable offer and they're just doing it to continue their bullying and to continue their control. Uh, and you need to be able to identify when they've got a chance of getting costs against you and when it's not, it's not going to happen. It, you know, you need to know your risks. So go and see someone. That would be a trigger point to go and see a lawyer. Well, thank you, Mum, for clearing up a little bit about costs. <laughs> I know that it's good to know now that if you've received an application and you've been served with your first lot of court documents, that that thing at the bottom that says that you're going to pay everything, don't stress too much because it is probably... It hardly ever happens. But keep in mind that even if you are self-represented, that you can end up paying their costs if you're wasting court time or not following the rules properly or asking for something unreasonable. So definitely go get some legal advice if you're being threatened that Mm. so that you're not ending up paying lots of money. Thank you, Mum, for your time. Your voice is about to go, Laura. (laughs) Yes. So I'm going to leave it there. And if anyone's interested, you can jump on the podcast, have a look at all the other episodes we've got. And also we are going to be doing some mini lessons for people to download on how to fill in some of the forms that we've been talking about Mm. recently. So if you're interested in that, go to the www dot the divorce course dot com dot au and also in the next episode we'll be revealing the winner of this month's podcast review if you would like to be in with a chance jump on the podcast the apple review uh, go to the divorce course podcast in apple and give us a review and we'll be choosing one of those lovely reviews and also mum i just wanted to let you know we've been getting lots of messages in from people that we didn't even know who were <laughs> listening to this yeah who have um you know finally got out of their their drama Um, there was even a lady who sent us a photo of her uh divorce settlement cake oh my goodness so (laughs) we'll have to put that on the instagram page if you're on tiktok come and find us i try and put everything mum says into 10 seconds short videos um and if you're on instagram come and find us there and if you want to talk directly to mum she manages the facebook messages I do. so jump on facebook <laughs> Dobber. all right thank you thank you so much for listening everybody and we'll be back next week okay, Thanks, look Mom. after yourself Laura. if you Bye, found this everyone. podcast helpful we'd love it if you could rate review and subscribe by doing so you are spreading the word to help someone else just like you Lynn would like to remind you that this podcast is general advice only and you should always get legal advice in relation to your particular situation. And remember that the Australian laws may have changed since recording.